Good morning and welcome here at Sederbeck Berlin. My name is Tony and I'm the pastor here and I'm so glad and excited that you're with us. If you are here for the very first time, let me tell you, we're so glad that you chose Sederbeck Berlin as your place to worship God this morning. And I want to encourage you to fill out an online connection card on our website, sederbeck.berlin, to let us know that you were here, let us know how we can pray for you. We have a prayer ministry that loves to pray for our congregation. So fill out an online connection card uh, for that. You can also ask us a bunch of questions or give us feedback or indicate that you're looking for a small group or that you have questions about faith and about our church. So fill that out and I will get back to you as soon as possible. We have a great online service for you this morning with worship music from Saddleback Worship in California. A great message, part three of our teaching series, Better, where we look into choosing progress over perfection. And part three is coming from our teaching pastor, Stacy Wood, today, where she talks about having a better mindset for this year. At the end of this online service, I have a, a bigger announcement for you today because there is a church-wide campaign, spiritual growth campaign, coming starting mid-February. If you want to find out more, um, stay until the end of this online service. But now, let me kick off this online service with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that, we, that you are calling us your children and that we can have a personal relationship with you, every single one of us, and that we can come together in your name. You will be wide here with your presence and you will be with us this morning. We want to invite your spirit to open our hearts and open our minds to receive from your word. Show us the areas where we need to improve in our lives and in our character, in our personality. Help us to understand what you want us to to work on through this message today. And dear Heavenly Father, we want to pray. We want to pray joyfully today. So um, we want to give everything that's bothering us, that's worrying us right now over to you to come before you as your child, as your servant, and really start to worship with an open heart. And we pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. How's it going? Come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's jump into worship. We're going to learn a new song that talks about God's faithfulness, that he is a promise keeper. Come on, let's, let's learn this together.
joy of our lives, God, to worship you, to live for you, to privilege, to live surrendered, to follow your lead.
Prince, and I want to welcome you to Saddleback Church. I want to give a warm welcome to all of our campuses that are joining us all over Southern California. And I also want to welcome our international campuses at Buenos Aires and Santa Rosa and Hong Kong and in Berlin. Man, we love you guys. We are so thankful for you. And all of you joining us online and at our extensions, Saddleback has a very expansive reach in the ministry. And, and it's just so cool to see how God is growing our family and the stories of life change that are coming out from all over the world. So we love you and we are glad that you are here with us this weekend. Now we are in the middle of a message series called Better. And the whole point, the whole emphasis behind this message series is that progress is better than perfection. I don't know about you, but I kind of like perfection. I don't, I mean, anybody? I mean, I, I like things to go perfectly. Like I want my plans to go perfectly. I want my kids to behave perfectly. I really like it when the dinner that I cooked turned out perfect. I, I just, perfect makes me happy. Like I, I am an Enneagram one on, uh, I don't know if you know about Enneagram, but if you don't know about Enneagram, basically what you need to know is perfection is my love language. And I, I just really like it when things are perfect. So I don't wanna just buy any old gift. Like I wanna buy the perfect gift. And I, I don't wanna just go on any vacation. I wanna go on the perfect vacation. And so there's like a lot of pressure that I live under of like, oh, it has to be perfect. And one thing that this message series is just really speaking to me about is that my desire for perfection is often in competition with my desire to get better. Does anybody relate to that? Like your desire for perfection is, is just in competition with your desire to get better. Like we all, we all wanna reach this big goal. We all have this big vision for our lives. But in sometimes instead of just kind of chipping away at it and getting a little bit better and a little bit better, we can get paralyzed by this big goal, this big dream, this desire to be perfect. I know it happens to me. And when things aren't going so well, then, then I start to feel more and more just paralyzed in the moment. I, I don't wanna attempt something if I don't think I can do it well. Or, or that inner critic in my head, the volume gets turned up so loud that, I, that it, it just works against me, my desire to keep getting better. And so this message series is, is super helpful for me. So we have been talking about um, just this concept of like, let's get a little bit better year over year, week over week. What can we do to keep making progress towards these big goals that we have in our life? Now, the Apostle Paul really embodied this this idea of, of just keep getting better. And if you were here a couple of weeks ago, Andy shared a verse out of Philippians where, where you can just kind of see his mindset. In Philippians 3, it'll be on the screen. It says, not that I have already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And then he says, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do Forgetting what's behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. It's this whole concept of I can grow and I can keep making progress and I might not know how to do it right now. It might be really hard for me right now, but don't get used to me because I am just getting better. You ain't seen the best of me yet. I keep telling Andy that after 20 years of marriage, babe, you ain't seen the best of me yet. I just keep getting better. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the idea of a better vision for our lives. And then last week, Andy talked about better habits that can help us start working toward that vision. And today what we're gonna look at is the concept of a better mindset, how we view our lives, how we view our circumstances, the things that we think about, and how it can take us to the destination that we want to go. Now, last time I spoke here at Saddleback, you might remember, I told a, a great story about one of my finer moments of motherhood. And this story included me throwing shoes and also yelling at my oldest son on his first day of high school. It was a very heartwarming story. I'm sorry if you missed it. Um, but basically the moral of the story was that my response is my responsibility. 
And before you write that down on your paper, today we are gonna take that one step for, further. We're gonna take that whole concept, we're gonna up the ante a little bit. That not only is my response my responsibility, but my thoughts are my responsibility. So not just the behaviors that are coming out of my life, but actually the thoughts that I allow to take up residence in my mind. And I know the pushback on that. You're like, how can I control the thoughts that are popping into my mind? I can't be held responsible for all these thoughts. And maybe there's some truth in that, but the thing that we do get to choose is which thoughts we're gonna dwell on. What are we gonna do with the thoughts that pop into our mind? One time a mentor of mine, Christine Kane, said that our thoughts are kind of like a train and that they are taking us to a destination. And you get to decide whether or not you get on that train. And so some thoughts, they should never become beliefs. Like you should just let that train pass you right on by. But we get to decide, am I gonna get on that train or am I gonna let it pass me by? I don't know if you've ever ridden on a train. One time Andy and I took an overnight train ride. We were in Thailand at the time. And this is like two weeks after we, or no, two months after we got married. So we were like 21 years old. You guys wanna see a picture of baby Andy and Stacy? Yeah, this is us on the train, <laughs> our overnight train ride. Um, it, was, it was a fun experience. You can take that down. Um, so. <laughs> So we were in Thailand, we were leading this mission trip with a group of high school students, and we were taking a train ride from Bangkok, Thailand to Chiang Mai. And we, we boarded the train, it was the coolest experience, you get to like see all this really cool scenery as you go by, and you get cozy in your train cart, and then you, you go to sleep. And the next morning you wake up, you're in a completely different location. Thankfully, when we woke up, we were in Chiang Mai. But what if, we weren't paying attention when we went through that train station and we had gotten on a train that was going to Kuala Lumpur. We would not have woken up in Chiang Mai. We would have been very surprised when we woke up and it does not matter how much we intended to land in Chiang Mai, we would not have been at the destination that we intended to be at. Our thoughts are like that. Like sometimes we have this very clear view in our minds of where we want our life to end up the destination that we're hoping to arrive at. But we get on the wrong train. And that train takes us in a completely different direction. And so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what is the mindset that I need to have to get me to this destination that I actually want to be. You know, this is not just modern psychology. We hear a lot of talk about how the battle is won and lost in the mind. And that's very true because our behaviors are impacted by our thoughts. You can't just address a behavior without first addressing the thought. This does, there's so much in modern psychology right now that's really helpful about mindsets and the, the power of the way that we think. But this originates way back to when the Bible was originally being written. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Like the way that you are transformed, the way that you are changed is by the renewing of your mind. So if you want a behavior to change, you have to actually address the thought process that is underneath that behavior. So all these habits that Andy was talking about last week, if we, if we only try to muscle through the habit without addressing the mindset around it, then we're not gonna get there, very, we're not gonna hang in there very long because there's just so far that willpower can take you, right? There's, there's just so far that it's gonna take you because you know you ought to do something, that you should do something because our desires are a lot stronger than our willpower. Our desire is a lot stronger than, than should. Like I should do that. Well, desire eats should for breakfast and it, that is just not gonna help you get the place that you want to be. It has to start in the mind. And if you can change your thinking around something, then your mind can actually command your heart. If you can get the right mindset about something, then your heart will be inclined to follow. And then you will be more successful at carrying out those habits long-term because your heart is saying, I want to do that. I want to go in that direction. You're more likely to end up at the destination that you wanna be. 
a while back, a mentor of ours, um, Harold Bullock, shared with us this diagram. And you can see in this diagram that there are, in all of our hearts, there are these desires that we have. And some of them are good desires, some of them not so good desires. And at the other side of um, the diagram, there's our behavior that comes out of our heart. But before we get from our desires to our behavior, it's filtered through our perspective and our values. In this message series, you might call perspective our mindsets and our values our priorities. Andy's gonna talk about priorities next week. So everything that's coming out of our hearts, we're filtering it through the things that we think about, our mindsets, and the things that we value our priorities. So you wanna make sure that you have the right mindsets and the right priorities in line because if you don't, then your behaviors are gonna be just not where you want them to be. You've probably heard the phrase, follow your heart. <laughs> That's such a stupid phrase. Never say that. You should never follow your heart. You'll follow it right off a cliff. What you need to do is filter your heart. You gotta filter your heart through the right mindset and the right priorities. So I wanna show you in the book of Philippians where we see this in the Apostle Paul. We're gonna hang out in the book of Philippians today. And the, it's important for you to remember that the book of Philippians was written when Paul was in prison. And so keep that in mind as you think about his mindset on life. In Philippians chapter one, you'll see on the screen, it says, now I want you to know brothers and sisters that what has happened to me, the fact that I'm in prison right now, has actually served to advance the gospel. I don't know about you, but that would not be my mindset. If I was in prison, I, I would be thinking, my life is over, and what am I doing here? But Paul, he had a different mindset. He had this mindset that said, hey, I, I may be in prison, I may have chains on me, but I am not bound. I am not limited. God's power is not limited, and the advancement of the gospel is not gonna stop because of my circumstances. And so Paul was busy telling the whole palace guard about the gospel. And he was busy writing letters to go out to these churches all over Asia Minor that would have an impact for generation after generation after generation. So he may have been in a limiting situation, a limiting circumstance, but he was not bound. And I wonder, man, how many of us need that mindset today? That your circumstances do not need to have you bound. That you're, the power of God in your life is not limited to your unfortunate situation. If we could adjust our mindset to wrap our minds around all that God could do, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, man, that's a whole different level of power that we step into. And so Paul is gonna unpack what does this mindset look like in the book of Philippians. He has a lot to say about mindset in this book. I just finished a study on the book of Philippians that Beth Moore did, and I learned so much. And one of the things I learned was there's this word that's kind of woven throughout the book of Philippians. The, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and so it's this Greek word, phreneo. And the word phreneo, it basically means mindset. So the definition is to think, to feel, and to direct one's mind to a thing. So this word is used a lot of times in the New Testament, 26 times. 23 of the times is by the Apostle Paul. So this is a big deal to the Apostle Paul. He's like really trying to shape the way we think about things. And 10 of those times are used in the book of Philippians, which is a really short book. It's only four chapters long, but he uses this word 10 times. So it's like a ribbon that's woven throughout the whole book of Philippians. And the Bible has so much to say about what this life in Christ can be like. Like so many positive things, like you could have the benefit of living with peace instead of anxiety with your life in Christ. It's like, oh yeah, I'd love that. Or you could have the benefit of living life to the full. It's like, that sounds good. Or you can live in harmony and navigate your relationships with grace. It's like, oh, sign me up for that. It's like, yeah, I wanna get to that destination, what the fullness of life in Christ can be like. But what is the mindset that I need to have in order to get on that train? Like which train is gonna actually take me there? So today, what I have for you is I have three tickets to a better train of thought. 
You guys like what I did there? You see that train of thought? It was good, right? Yeah, I worked hard on that one. Because you don't want your life to be derailed, right? <laughs> you guys like a good pun, huh? Okay, so we're gonna look at three examples of where Paul uses this word phreneo, mindset, in the book of Philippians, and we're gonna unpack it a bit. The first example is gonna be in Philippians 2, verse 2 where he says, make my joy complete by being like-minded. That's the word for neo. Having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. That's actually also the word for neo. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I was thinking about this this idea of Paul wanting us to be like-minded, having one mind. I was like, what does that even look like in our day and age? Because we live in a day and age where everybody has their own opinion and everybody feels completely free to share it. And like, never did we see this more than when we were in COVID together, right? And everybody had an opinion about the virus and how it should be handled and racial injustice and the political spectrum that we lived through. And at least here in the United States, man, it felt like our country was coming apart at the seams because everybody had a different opinion. Even within the church, people did not see things the same way. So I I was thinking, what do you mean, Paul? What does it look like for us to be like-minded? Well, I'll tell you what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean that everybody needs to flatten out your personality and just let go of your personal convictions, your perspective, your opinion, just so you can get along with everybody. That's not what he's getting at here. What he's saying is that it's not all about you. And there is something bigger at stake here than your perspective or your preference. You see, God is calling us to live in community with one another. That's what this passage is all about, that we would honor one another, that we would consider other people's interests and their needs as even more important than our own. He's calling us to live in community. And so this first point is that a better mindset is familial. Familial. I chose that word because God uses the language of family all throughout the New Testament, that God is our father and that Other believers are brothers and sisters in Christ. There's this concept of family and community, and that's how he intends us to live. But it's funny, because I was like, I don't think most families have this mindset. (laughs) Like, I don't know about your family. Uh, I would be very curious to know how many of you grew up in a family of origin or your current family, where you're like, yeah, like this is, this is kind of how we live, just selfless, just like considering the needs of others above our own. It's like, oh, you need 10 more minutes in the bathroom? Sure, take your time, go right ahead. Oh, you, you wanna have the last bowl of cereal? No problem, help yourself, I'll do the dishes. Like that, that's just how we roll, that's how it rolls. Well, if that is you, I just wanna say well done, you are doing something right. That is the way God intended for us to live. But that's just not where most most of us actually do live. And in in most of our families, I would would guess that dinner time is more like a free-for-all and everybody's fighting over that last piece of bread and that last piece of chicken and your kids are all like, I'm sitting in the front seat, you get in the back. I mean, it's not so much this like selfless, you go ahead kind of mentality. So in some ways, the familial mindset doesn't actually connect with actually what God is trying to communicate here. But I I think that that mindset that we tend to live with is based on scarcity, right? Like I got to watch out for me because nobody else will. There's not enough to go around. And so I have to take care of me. There's a scarcity mindset. But listen, when God is your father, there's always more than enough. It says in the Bible that my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. And so you can have a double portion of the mashed potatoes. You can eat all the meat you want. He never runs out. He is the supplier and he has enough. And I think that having that mindset, man, it it totally reshapes the way that we see life. That we don't have to live with scarcity anymore because our God can meet our needs. And if God's meeting my needs, then I can lift up my head 
and think about meeting the needs of someone else. You know how we develop this familial mindset is by living life in community. That's why here at Saddleback, we value small groups so much. We want every single person who attends Saddleback to be in community, in a small group with other people, because that's where God really does the work of maturity inside of us. Like we get in close proximity to other people and all those rough edges that we have, they start to rub off a little bit. Because isn't it interesting how we can all feel, we can feel so pure and holy and kind and loving when the only person you have to interact with is yourself, <laughs> right? But then you have to start interacting with someone else who annoys you or who asks a little bit more of you than what you intended to ever give. And you're like, oh, maybe I am a little bit more selfish than I thought I was. God has the opportunity when we put ourselves in community to develop this familial mindset inside of us. And so the question that I would love for us to reflect upon this week is how can I better prioritize the needs of others this week? How can I better prioritize the needs of others this week? All right, now, number two, the second example that we have of where Paul uses this um, word for neo in the book of Philippians. We're just gonna continue on in this passage of Philippians 2. And he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That word mindset is the word for neo. And some translations actually translate it as attitude. Like your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And so what does he mean by it? what attitude, what mindset is he wanting us to take on? He's gonna explain it in the next few verses. It says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So point number two is a better mindset is humble. A better mindset is familial, a better mindset is humble. I don't know if there is another passage in all of the Bible that is more countercultural than this passage. Because this passage is the antithesis of everything that our world esteems. We see how Jesus, he willingly and he knowingly chose to step away from his prestige and the power and the glory that he had in heaven. And he stepped into a whole different reality where he knew he would be misunderstood and misrepresented and mistreated. He was used to having angels at his disposal to serve him at all times. And he stepped away from that into this reality where he would take on the form of a servant. I mean, who, who does that? Who willingly steps away from all this glory into a reality that is much lower, much more humble of a status. It's the, it's the opposite of the way that we tend to approach life. We live in a world where everyone is fighting for position and we're looking for an advantage and we're like trying to build our own platforms of influence. But man, Jesus, Jesus took the opposite approach to life. So many of us hate that feeling of like being under authority right? Like the word obey has become a bit of like a cuss word in this generation. When our kids were little, they attended this uh, parent participation school. And so I was in the classroom every single week working with the kids. And the, some of the training that we went through as parents, um, as we were working with the kids, they were like, okay, if you ever have a kid who's being really uncooperative, not doing what they're supposed to do, these are your options. You can redirect them. You can give them other options. You can try to talk to them to see how they're feeling. Try to connect with them, with them on a personal level. Never did they say this child needs to obey. <laughs> like that is not a priority. And it was, it's just so interesting how we have gotten to a point where we feel like requiring obedience is like controlling or stifling. But how about this? The king of all kings submitted to authority. How about this? Jesus Christ obeyed his father. He humbled himself. Why? 
Why would he choose to do this? Because he trusted his father. Because he was secure in his love. He was, it says that he was in very nature God. He didn't have to earn that, but he also didn't feel the need to prove it to everyone else. He didn't walk around Nazareth with a chip on his shoulder, trying to make sure everyone else thought he was as important as he actually was. He was secure in the Father's love. He knew who he was. And he trusted that God had a bigger purpose in mind. That this reason for him to step out of heaven and into this very humble circumstance, there was a greater good that was being accomplished through this. He trusted the purpose of his father. There's that phrase in there that says that he took the very nature of a servant. Maybe even a better translation for that word servant would be the word slave. It's like when we hear that word slave, we have such a visceral reaction. Like I am I am no man's slave, right? Like the other day, a couple weeks ago, Karis and I were in the kitchen together and she was helping me with some stuff or she wasn't really helping me, she was just in the kitchen. And, um, <laughs> and, but I needed her help with something. And normally she's a great helper. I gotta make that clear. She's normally awesome. Uh, but in this moment, I asked her for some help and she was like giving me pushback, like she didn't wanna help. And I said to her, Karis, you need to be a servant. And she looked at me so offended. And she was like, I am not a servant. <laughs> and isn't that how we think? Like we're like, oh no, I'm gonna work really hard so I can pay someone else to serve me. Somebody else can clean my house. Somebody else can mow my fake, fake grass. Like I am not a servant. I am working really hard not to be a servant. And maybe one day I'll choose to serve you. But the minute you start seeing me as a servant, that's a completely different identity. I don't want to identify like that. But that is the identity that Jesus willingly took on on our behalf and the identity that he wants us to embody as we relate to one another. I wonder how much energy are we wasting just like grasping at prestige and success and position and other people's approval and attaboys. When Jesus did it, a whole different way. He humbled himself. He made himself nothing. He trusted the love of the Father, the Father's greater purpose. The question I want us to ask ourselves is what rights do I need to lay aside for God's greater purpose? There's a purpose that God is working in your life. And maybe for you, it's gonna feel like a setback. And you're so scared to come with open hands before God because you're so used to grasping at more and more power, more and more authority, more and more prestige. And God's saying, hey, will you let it go? And will you trust me with it? Now, the third, the third example that we're gonna look at of this word for Neo, mindsets, is in the next chapter of Philippians, in chapter three. And it says, for as I've often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. That little phrase there, their mind is set, is the word for neo. And if you do a search of the Bible for this word for neo, you'll find another time that there's like a counterpart verse to this verse, over in the book of Philippians, where, God, where Paul uses the word phreneo there too. And check out this next verse where it says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. So set your mind, that's the word phreneo. And I love the intentionality of that phrase, that we, we get to set our minds. It reminds me kind of of the word mind sets, right? We set our minds, we get to choose what it is that we focus on, what we fill our minds with. So are we just gonna always focus on, always think about the here and now, like what's right in front of us, what we can see and feel and hear? This is what's real to me. Am I always gonna focus on that? Or am I gonna set my mind on the things above, the things of heaven, the things of eternity? And that's the third point, that a better mindset is eternal. So a better mindset is familial and it's humble and it's eternal. That phrase 
that was in the verse, their mind is set on earthly things. If you kept reading that passage, the very next phrase says, but your citizenship is in heaven. And so you're just passing through here. Like your passport might say, you're a citizen of the United States or you're a citizen of the Philippines, but you're only the citizen of that country for a limited amount of time. You're really a citizenship, your real citizenship is in heaven. That's your true citizenship because this life, it is just a vapor, it is a mist. We are here today and we could very well be gone tomorrow. But our citizenship in heaven will remain for all eternity. It's so much easier to think about the here and now because it's what's always in front of us. It's always in our face. But there is a much larger reality that we will one day step into that will be more real than anything we are currently experiencing. And when we can, when we can start to live that way with heaven in view, man, there are so many benefits that having an eternal mindset gives us. Like for example, when you have an eternal mindset, it helps you to get through the trials of life. It gives you the perseverance that you need because you realize that no matter how awful your current circumstances are, no matter how much pain you're currently living in, it is but for a season. And these trials compared to eternity are light and momentary. An eternal mindset will give you that perspective. Eternal mindset will help you to make better decisions. Decisions that are based on what is ultimate instead of what is immediate. Because we get so wrapped up in pursuing today's pleasures, like what feels good right now? I wanna pursue that. I get so entangled in what feels good now because I take my mind off of what I ultimately desire. It's the immediate over the ultimate. But an eternal mindset, it helps us to let go of these things that are holding us back, these addictions, these issues with sin that we wish that we weren't all locked up in. It helps us to give us a greater purpose of what's in front of us, something to live for. An eternal mindset reminds us of what is truly important. That there is something bigger at stake here and every person that I interact with, no matter how annoying or frustrating, that person has a soul that will live on for all eternity. And so the way that I interact with them is different when I have that eternal mindset at the front of my thinking. A lot of times, I find that people fear surrendering their life to God because they fear what he will ask them to let go of. Like what will I have to give up to really surrender my life to God? But what they're forgetting is how much they will gain. That there is, that there is this eternal reward in store for them. That there's this abundant life that's in store for them. But they're, they're clinging to what is immediate and what is temporary. I love this quote by Jim Elliott. He was a missionary in Ecuador, actually ended up being martyred. And one day he wrote this in his journal where he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You guys, you can't, we can't hold on to this life. Like we can't hold on to our prestige. You can't hold on to your beauty or your 401k. <laughs> Like it's, it's just all fleeting. And one day it will all be gone. But I will tell you what is real. There is a coming savior and there is an eternal reward for those who live for him. So the question I want us to reflect on today is where am I currently prioritizing the immediate over the ultimate? What do I need to be willing to let go of in this short period so that I can actually reach the ultimate goal of where I wanna be? What is the destination that you have in mind for your life? And I'll tell you what, there is nothing better than life in Christ. There is no more fulfilling way to live than to live fully surrendered to him. It is the adventure of a lifetime. And if that is the destination where you want to end up, man, you gotta think about the train that you're on. Are you on the train that thinks about community and is familial? Are you on a train that with your heart, your mindset that is humble? And will you keep eternity in mind? As we wrap up our time together, I want us to go back to that passage in Philippians 2 where we started off. Because 
Paul has some things to say about eternity here. And he says, therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place. So if you remember, he started off at the highest high. He was in very nature God. But then he went to the lowest low of the death on a cross. And now he is being exalted again to the highest place. So it is like from glory to glory with the cross in between. That is the story of the gospel. That is, that is our God. It says that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, there are many people who refuse to make that confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. There are many people listening to the sound of my voice right now that refuse to make that confession. And maybe it's because you're like here because you're exploring faith and you're trying to figure out what it is that you even believe about Jesus. And if that's where you are, listen friend, I wanna tell you, you are in the right place. This is a safe place to explore faith and we are so glad that you're here. Some of you may be in that position right now because you kinda like the feeling of freedom. Like I'm the captain of my own ship. I'm no man's slave, and that's why you won't confess. Or maybe for you, eternity just feels so far off, and so like, why would I make that confession now? I've got all this time. But listen, friend, according to this passage, one day you will confess that Jesus is Lord. There are many people in the world today that speak disparagingly of the name of Jesus Christ. His name has become a curse word to many. And there are those that would willfully dis, just not acknowledge his existence, try to disprove his existence, to undermine his authority. But listen, one day their knee will also bow. Because there's gonna come a day where everything that feels so real right now is gonna fade away. And every eye will behold him. The Bible says that every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But on that day, friend, it will not be confession unto salvation. It will just be confession of what has become very obvious, something very clear that, oh, oh, okay, you really are Lord. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. This day, not that day. But the decision that you make on this day can forever change your reality on that day. And so right now in our service, I just wanna create a little bit of space for those people who are struggling with this decision in your heart. You've been wrestling through this desire of whether or not to surrender your life to Jesus, whether or not to trust him. Listen, friend, he, the reason that he died that humble death on the cross, it was for you. It was for love. It was because he wanted to offer forgiveness to you. He wanted to offer a way back to God that all your shame could be wiped away, all your past mistakes could be hidden in the cross, that he is your covering and he is inviting you in today. You could make that confession today that Jesus Christ will be Lord of my life. And so in just a moment, I'm gonna pray. And if that is something that God is stirring in your heart, I wanna invite you to say the words that I'm gonna say in your own heart. And today, friend, today can be the day of your salvation. Let's pray together. God, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, that I don't get it all right, I make a lot of mistakes, and I need forgiveness. I need someone to come and wipe my slate clean and so Jesus, I thank you for what you did for me on the cross. I receive the forgiveness that you offer. I receive your love. And today I want to make you the Lord of my life. I surrender control to you. 
you will be my God and I will live for you. Thank you that you provided a way to have new life in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
This is Pastor Tony again. What a wonderful morning to worship our Lord and what a great message, what a great, very practical message by Pastor Stacy. I love that here at Setterback, one of our values is doable discipleship. We don't just want to tell you what's written in the Bible, we want to help you to apply what you learned. And that's why our messages are very practical. That's why we have a talk it over document um, for each one of the sermons in the growth section of our website that will help you um, doing the small group discussion time, for example, to reflect on the major points of this sermon. But you can also use this document to reflect on your own on some of these topics. And so I encourage you to make use of that. I said at the beginning that we are going to have a church-wide spiritual growth campaign very soon. And let me dive into that. First, let me talk to those of you who have never done a campaign with Saddleback, people who have joined us maybe very recently or in the past one or two years. A spiritual growth campaign means that all over the world, every campus, all of the services from adults to kids and our small groups will dive into one specific topic, into one area of our faith. And so this year, on February 19th, we will start our One Life campaign. One Life is about having one person in your life that you like and love so much that you want to share Jesus with them. We help you to understand what evangelism is, what sharing the gospel is. We will motivate you on how to do that in the specific circumstances um, that you're in, and we will pray with you to take the next steps. This is what the One Life campaign is about. Why is this so important? Because evangelism is one of the five purposes of our church. You probably know that our church is a purpose-driven church. And so we want to balance the five purposes in our lives. And so there is, of course, there is worship, there is fellowship, there is discipleship, there is ministry, and then there is evangelism. And we know that the purpose that most people in our congregation struggle with is evangelism. And so in order to help you to have a balanced life, um, we need to talk about evangelism. We need to talk about why it's important to share the gospel and why is it important to have at least one person, one life uh, that you can share Jesus with. This is what this campaign is about. And so we will have over the course of four weeks, we will dive into that in our weekend services through the messages by Pastor Andy. 
we have resources for our small groups, especially a book that we will print over here that will help you to dive into this topic. It kind of serves as a devotional book, as a prayer guide uh, during this time. And you will only get this book if you're in a small group. And so I want to encourage you uh, to be part of this campaign. And now let me tell you three ways to be part of this campaign. First of all, if you're in a small group, talk to your small group hosts about joining the campaign and receiving these great resources. Um, I will reach out to all of the small group hosts anyway and give them some more information about this campaign, about what this is about and what resources are available. Um, and so make sure to talk to your small group hosts about joining this campaign. Second, you can also start a small group just for this campaign, just for the four weeks. We will help you get it started. We will give you some training uh, to start your group. And if you want to do that, reach out to us. Send an email to tony at satterback.de or fill out an online connection card on our website and simply write down one live campaign and that you like to start a small group. And the third part is you can join a small group. And there are two options. You can join an existing small group that will even continue after this campaign, or you can join an on-campus small group. On-campus small group means that for the course of these four weekends, um, over these four Sundays, we will have a small group session after our Sunday service at our venue. So we will share some food and drinks, of course, and we will dive into the small group part of the campaign. I would love to see you there if you are not yet in a small group. We will also offer an online on-campus small group that will happen during the week. For those of you who cannot be there on Sunday, you can also join an online small group for this campaign to dive into these areas. And so if that was a little bit too much for you, check out the video description on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube or check out the notes section here at our watch experience on our website setterback.berlin. There is a link that will help you, um, uh, that leads to a sign up form where you can indicate that you would love to join a small group, that you would love to join an on-campus small group or that you would love to start a small group. Um, and so I encourage you to click on that link and let us know that you wanna be part of this one live campaign and use this these four weeks for your spiritual growth in the area of evangelism. I've talked a lot right now. If you have any questions, fill out the online connection cards, drop me a message, send me an email to tony at saddleback.de. I'm available for you to answer your questions. Now let me quickly pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this great time of worship, for this great word from Pastor uh, Stacy um, on how to have a better mindset. We feel so encouraged to work on ourselves, um, to work on our character, on our personality, and on all the things in our lives, and to choose progress over perfection. We also want to start praying for this one person, this one life, um, this one person that we have in our lives that we can't wait to share Jesus with, but sometimes we are too afraid. Sometimes we don't know where to start. And this is where this One Life campaign comes in. And we look forward to that. And dear God, I want to ask you to bless everyone that is watching this online service right now so that they can experience your grace, your love, and the fellowship of your spirit in this coming week. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Bye.